There's a book called Drift into Failure, uh, written by Sidney Decker, who has spent a lot of his life studying complex systems and how they fail. And he, at one point in his book, he says this, the explosive growth of software has added greatly to systems' interactive complexity. With software, the possible states that a system can end up in become mind-boggling. He spends most of his book talking about uh, systems like airplanes and space shuttles and uh, medical systems, and very rarely touches on software. And in the book, he's showing how all these systems, uh, they reach a point of complexity where you cannot reason about it from any local perspective. There is no view of the system where you can hold it all in your mind. No computer can even hold it all and reason about it. And then he says th something like this. And then you add software and it makes it exponentially worse. He says, however, that we can model and understand in isolation. And so what he's talking about there is, if I take an individual component, I can think about it, we design it. And he references like a Boeing 747. And so a Boeing 747, I think it's that fan that's blowing on me somewhere. <laughs> um, so he talks about being able to model and understand in isolation. So he uses the Boeing 747 as an example. At some point, humans have actually designed the whole thing. It's got blueprints. They were able to build it. And as, it, as it's coming off the assembly line on a factory floor, someone does, is able to actually walk you through the whole thing. But then he says, when released into competitive, nominally regulated societies, their connections proliferate. Their interactions and inter interdependencies mul multiply, and their complexities mushrooms. And we were caught short. What he's talking about here is the example he gives of that Boeing 747. It leaves the, the factory, you turn it on, the software starts up, the engines start to uh, move, you put pilots in the seats, you take off, you interact with air traffic control, the weather, and then over the years, the maintenance and operations of that plane. And it moves from what is called, from a, com a complicated um, machine into a complex system. And the difference from complicated to complex is that complicated, you can actually sit down and reason about it. Maybe not very many people can, but someone somewhere is actually able to walk you through how that, how that machine was designed and built. But once it leaves and gets into the world, it now moves into a realm of complexity, and it's a complex system that cannot be reasoned about, and we've got problems. I'm going to walk through some of the ways that we build complex systems that behave differently in practice than what we think about when we first uh, apply them. One of them that's very common in software systems is a read-through cache. We've got a bunch of systems that need to access data, and they, we put a cache in front of them for performance. We access the data. There's a low uh, cache miss rate. And when we miss, we fall back to the origin servers, and then we write it back to the cache, and everything works well. We lose a shard of that cache. What happens? Suddenly, we've got a miss rate of 10, 20, 30%, and we pivot and DDoS our underlying servers. And that origin becomes overwhelmed, and now our entire service fails. We originally added that cache for performance reasons. We had a, an origin server, the origin servers, for some reason, they, either they weren't able to achieve the latency characteristics, or the cost of delivering the data was too high on them, and so we'd rather put it all in a cache. What then happens, though, is that we then either start to scale down our origin fleet, because we now only need 1% of the traffic normally, or over time, traffic increases, we scale up the caches, but don't scale up the origin service with it. Uh, and so for cost savings reasons, or operational failure, or a lot of things, we end up in this mode where now we're uh, vulnerable to, to availability outages. And it's because we start reasoning, we, we fix one thing over here, and it causes a different problem over there. Another one is when we have a system with multiple dependencies and the transitive nature of what happens. A single failure in a distributed system with a lot of transitive dependencies can break the entire user experience. I may have 100 independent systems all interacting, any one of them going down, if I'm not managing uh, the, these possible fault modes, can take down the entire user experience. And then worse, they can transitively affect others. Another one that is easy to get wrong, and we put them in place for one reason, and then they impact us in other ways, 
And this is, uh, again, another example of how complexity affects us in emergent ways, is sticky sessions. We start out with a user interaction, and we start to put in uh, state in the, the box, but then it starts to complicate how you fail and how you scale. Scaling up isn't too bad, but scaling down all of a sudden becomes like a defragmentation problem. And there, sometimes this is the right solution, but you have to take these into account. Other times, solving the ease of state management becomes a much greater complex problem in how the overall system behaves. And one of the funniest human aspects of this is we're focusing on getting a, uh, a feature developed. We hit the point where we're like, it's done, we're shipping it. And then, unfortunately, this is often what we as developers do. We think, as we're rolling out the door, I'm like, I wonder if there's something that I should have accounted for related to resilience. And generally, by that point, it is far too late to do anything about it. And project management has moved on and uh, assumed that you've already taken that into account. The premise of all this is that we must design for resilience. It's not something that you add on. It's not something that infrastructure can just do on our behalf. We actually have to design it into our applications. I'm going to go to a, uh, a nuclear reactor uh, design to, to demonstrate how a different industry does this. This is a fourth gen reactor. Uh, we don't, uh, it's still in a design and experimental, uh, as all the fourth gen reactors primarily are. This one does some things a lot better than the second and third gen reactors that have not so pleasant failure modes. This one has a very creative feature in it, which is a freeze plug, and I'll explain what that is. So this particular reactor type has a plug which would melt if the molten mass got too hot for any reason, draining it away into a protected lower tank, which would stop any fissioning and cool the whole lot down. So you've got the reactor going, first design thing of this particular reactor is the fuel's already molten, so you can't actually have a meltdown because you don't have fuel rods that will melt, you, you, the, the, everything is already melted. The second part of it though, and this is the part that's really clever, as he says, is that the plug is a, a frozen uh, wedge of salt, and it's stuck in the bottom, and they're actively cooling it so that as long as the system is healthy and happy, the plug stays in there, the fuel is in the, the reactor, and the whole process continues. If at any point in time, however, you lose power, as it says here, if power is lost for some reason, which might threaten to overheat the, the reactor, the fan stops, the plug melts, and the salts all drain away. Key part here, if power is lost for some reason. Fukushima, the issue with that is that it required active cooling to keep the reactor, the, the, the process, stable. As soon as they lost that, that, the power, all of those systems failed along with it, and they no longer had mechanisms to actually contain it. This design, on the other hand, fails gracefully. It degrades in a way that if you just pull the plug on the entire thing, you can just sit there and watch it, and it drains away the, the, uh, the fuel into tanks that can then dissipate it, and the whole uh, reaction process shuts down. This is the type of stuff that we need to think about as we build software systems, so that we don't do like Fukushima, but we can instead be more like this reactor, whereas they've done experimental designs of this. They sit in the control room and literally just flip the main switch on the reactor and just watch the whole thing degrade gracefully. Richard Cook uh, is a professor who has spent his career studying complex systems, and he talks about the fact that system operations are dynamic, that the, the components within them are constantly failing and being replaced. A complex system, this is one of the characteristics of it. It, is, it never has a stable point. It is constantly churning and moving. So, starting to apply some examples from Netflix, several years ago, we were serving one country, the US, from a data center, and since then, we've rolled out into a lot more countries and a lot more customers. And along the way, we migrated from our own data center into the Amazon cloud, and we're now in three of their regions. And within each of those regions, we deploy to multiple availability zones. And then within each of those, we have hundreds of clusters. Within each of those clusters, we have handfuls up to hundreds and, uh, and beyond uh, instances in each of those clusters. And within each of those clusters, instances can fail at any time. Uh, for numerous types of reasons, or we might be auto-scaling them away, or we might be deploying new code, all kinds of things that can cause them to fail. They just automatically replace themselves. And this is just normal operation. In this type of environment, we don't even concern ourselves with the, the fear that an instance might go away, because it is just 
a, a natural aspect of how the system behaves. This gets a little bit more interesting when you start to look at the interrelationships, because that's where complex systems actually start to be defined, is by their relationships. If everything is just completely isolated from each other, there isn't much of a system there. It's in their relationships where it emerges. And so one, one instance in one cluster has relationships with multiple other clusters and talks with instances within them. And as this uh, occurs, if you zoom into one of the, in that box at the top, it typically is serving, at least in our world, you're serving a single user request. That user request then is going to be fulfilled by multiple calls down the stack. It is no, uh, is pretty typical for one incoming user request to ultimately talk to dozens of machines and perform several dozen network calls across our, our SOA. This is where failure happens. It is when many small, apparently in, uh, innocuous failures join to create opportunity for a systemic accident. So an individual box failing at any given point in time is a trivial event, and we don't even register it anymore in our systems. That is a long solved problem, redundancy and retries and those types of things take care of it. Failure, the big ones that actually impact you, show up on TechCrunch and those types of things, are these kind of things, where lots of things get together and you have emergent behavior that uh, occurs um, honestly without anyone typically being able to understand what triggered the, the chain of events to allow it to happen. Here's a, a simple example. We have one box that fails. It's going to cause the, the original request to fail. In a simple failure mode where you just have one box fail, you easily pivot and retry and, and leverage redundancy. If, however, you have things gang up and cause an entire cluster to fail, you have a much different problem. And in software, this is very easy to have happen because often our bugs are deployed everywhere at the same time. Then this transitively goes across our ecosystem, and you can start to transitively take down the entire system. And so because of this, you can very rapidly end up with all the resources and, and user experience all destroyed by one sit portion of your system transitively affecting failure. So let's zoom in within a box for a second where we can reason about it a little bit easier. Within a single box, let's assume that you're using a threaded model. Netflix is in this like transitionary point where we've got um, some that are event-based, some that are uh, uh, native thread-based blocking I.O. Most of our systems are still like that, and so we still have to reason a lot about the thread per request model. The threads are finite resources that if we don't uh, take care of them, we can very easily saturate them all. And in fact, one user request being blocked by latency very quickly can do this. At high volume, when you're doing tens of, uh, or hundreds of thousands of uh, requests per second, and your cluster only has a finite number of tens of thousands of threads across all the machines, it can actually take less than a second to completely wipe out an entire cluster. And that's actually what can happen. Within that dependency, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's the business logic of actually putting together the, the request. There's the serialization logic. There's the network request itself and all the different ways that that can fail. You can black hole against some instance that's no longer there. Firewall issues, you can get a, a slow network connection that is just trickling data back so the read timeout never triggers. Uh, you can have problems then when you're post-processing the data. There's all kinds of novel ways that it can fail. This is what a production outage looks like when every thread in the system piles up. And I remember this particular outage a couple years ago. We came in, we're looking at the thread uh, uh, traces, the thread dumps and stack traces on our systems, and the entire cluster was pegged waiting on uh, I.O. And this was a multi-hour event. So I want to come back to this quote again. This is how complex systems fail. It is not because one independent node uh, fails where you've got redundancy. That's an easy problem that is more or less solved. Everyone can grok that one quite easily. It's when these small failures all join together to cause emergent failure patterns that, uh, where the catastrophic failures that can, uh, can occur. So we need to start to take our systems and decouple them and be able to take control of those relationships. Complex systems are defined by their relationships, and that's where we can start to influence how they fail. So 
One of those approaches is bulkheading. Bulkheading is a, a pattern and term stolen from the shipping industry. And within a ship, it's divided up into compartments so that any given compartment, if you get punctured, it will fill and flood that portion, but not flood the rest of it. Tip, don't do it like the Titanic. You don't want the tops open so that as one fills up, it then floods into the next, into the next, and takes you down. It's partially a joke, but actually it's very legitimate in our space. If you are doing um, bulkheading across your system, it is, because you are all on a shared resource of a machine, it's actually still a problem in the fact that the load that is being occurred by bulkheading on one, even if you've isolated it to a finite number of uh, resources, like threads or connections, if the overall load that they are putting on the system can impact it enough that it takes the whole thing down, the bulkheading itself can still not contain it enough if you're not careful. And so the load on the CPUs can in turn cause everything else to become latent and everything, it can still trickle across. In my experience, what that means is the bulkheads have to be very constrained. They have to be constrained enough that the resources that are allowed to uh, be saturated on any given dependency are small enough that they cannot take down the rest of the system. So with this principle, we want to be able to isolate things and bulkhead them. In our system, what that means is that any given relation into the system, we want to take control of how we're going to interact with them. And so that relationship is where we want to inject ourselves. If we don't take control of that, we have no ability to manage how we're going to fail. And we want to fail instead in a way that we control. We want to degrade gracefully, we want to shed load, we want to protect the resources in our system so we can serve as much healthy traffic through as we can while isolating the failures. Netflix uh, ended up implementing a lot of these patterns. We gave it a cool logo and a name. And the basic premise of it is very sim simple. There's two primary patterns that we use. One of them is we, in front of any resource that we're going to access over a network boundary, we put in front of it a triable semaphore, which is a very cheap way of, it's basically just an incrementing counter. And we attempt to get uh, uh, the, the resource. And if it has been saturated, if the number of resources are already saturated, we immediately reject. And we reject and go through either fallback logic or we shed load. With non-blocking I.O., we can combine this with timeout behavior because we can do asynchronous timeouts. And on blocking I.O., we flip from uh, semaphore to a much more expensive solution with thread pools but we have chosen to optimize for resilience over resource utilization in this case. And the reason why we used an extra thread on it is because unfortunately we cannot trust that the socket level timeouts on those things are going to be sufficient for a variety of reasons of how Synax are, are dealt with in cloud environments that you can't necessarily trust that they're going to behave right and slow network connections can often just keep pushing the read timeout back while the overall duration can end up being measured in seconds when you're expecting it to be in milliseconds. And so we wrap the uh, outgoing calls with blocking I.O. These are particular implementation details, but to give an example of how we have chosen to bulkhead. And so we bulkhead with semaphores and threads, and you'll see that the common pattern here is that we're constraining how, much, uh, how many resources are going to be allocated. Let's say I have 100 possible threads. Uh, if I'm using a threaded system, I may limit one of my 20 backends to be able to only use 10 at any given point in time. If I'm using a non-blocking, a fully non-blocking system, then it changes it up and it's about how much you want, how deep you want your queues to be. You do not want unbounded queues and just keep accepting user requests that you can never fulfill. You still want to bound your system, but you can be a little bit more lenient because it's far cheaper to uh, have a queue grow somewhat versus uh, saturating your threads. Timeouts and circuit breakers often get all the attention, but they are nothing. They, they release the pressure. They re, they release the user back or can shed load more quickly, but by themselves they are too slow to actually kick in in time. Full outages in a system at, at, with high throughput typically is happening in milliseconds. It's not happening over multiple seconds or minutes that you fail. You typically something happens and the whole system falls over in less than a second. So if you're not limiting and protecting the resources, timeouts and circuit breakers are kicking in far too late. So some of the patterns we use for then how to degrade are, uh, first of all, 
you execute your logic. As you degrade, though, this is where it gets interesting. The first one is you, want, you can just fail fast. Failing fast is not great for the user, but it is great for the system. It allows you to shed load and keep the system as healthy as possible. And this does one of two things. Either it's just a subset of your functionality that's failing, and so you keep your systems healthy so they can keep serving the rest of the traffic, or let's say it is actually a critical thing and your, your systems aren't able to serve any users. At least though in that case, as soon as the functionality comes back, a second later you can now start responding to customers. Whereas I have seen many production systems where without that kind of load shedding behavior, you saturate every single queue in the system, and then when finally the, behavior, the, the functionality returns, it takes minutes for the machines to come back to health. And we would far prefer the system, uh, the, the problem is resolved, seconds later you're now serving traffic again. Better though is if I can start to degrade in a way that the user's experience degrades rather than uh, fails completely. The most basic one is to fail silently. You turn functionality off. You return empty lists, nulls, maybes, whatever uh, structure fits, and you do it so that if I'm on a user page, let's say, and the recommendations might go away, the similars might go away, some uh, social interaction might go away, but the shopping cart is still there in the, in the key critical functions. Static fallbacks is another one. There's often times where I may have certain behavior where I want it to be customized by the user, but if I'm not unable to get it, let's just degrade into some default mode. Stubbed fallbacks are one that we do a lot, where I've got portions of the data from other systems I've interacted with, the user cookie coming in when they authenticated. I'm unable to go and get perhaps their personalized behavior, or I'm unable to go get the most live data from the data store right now, but I can put together the bits that I do have mock out the default responses for the rest and continue. One example that some of you may have seen if you use Netflix is if you've ever, if you've ever browsed through the Netflix experience and typically you've got uh, the bars and the check boxes and it depends on your UI showing where you are in a season or a movie and it will remember where you are and be able to resume you. Every once in a while you may see that you come into your UI and all that's gone and you now have to manually figure out where you are. What that is is that you are in a degraded experience where we have failed to get the, the bookmark, but instead of blowing up your entire experience, we're saying, we're gonna still let you see it, push the play button, but the degraded experience is you may have to scrub through to the point where you are, or remember which episode of a, of a TV season you were on. That's us optimizing for the fact that we, we, we would rather give a degraded experience rather than just completely fail your attempt. And this is what it looks like for us in code. And we chose a very in-your-face approach for this because of various contexts as, and biases as to what we were doing in our system. There's lots of different ways that this could be done. And so the, the general point is that do what I want to do, but if I can't do that for whatever reason, either my resources are saturated, I've timed out, I'm circuit, uh, the circuit has tripped, uh, different things, we always have the same fallback path that we then execute for all those failure modes. Getting a little bit more complicated, and we do this on our personalized systems, is that we try and get the live uh, personalized information. If that's uh, unavailable, we'll pivot to a different network call in fallback that it itself is also isolated and bulkheaded, and we'll go to something like another cache that might have stale data or less personalized data. If that also fails, then there's the tertiary fallback where we go to something local. Now, for example, we could just say, here's Avengers, go watch Avengers. Now, we don't actually go get that bad, but we might get to something that's very different than what the personalized catalog would be that we would normally want to show you, but we might be showing you, here's the most popular content in the meantime. We recognize that that's a degraded experience, and we also recognize that the viewing actually drops. If we put our system into fallback mode, less people actually do watch. Now, that's actually a good thing, because that would mean all of our personalization stuff is completely useless. And so, we actually do see the drop, but we would rather have a percentage drop in people choosing to view than kill the entire system just because we can't get the optimal experience. Transitive failures are where this stuff really comes to light. If I have one system fails down there in the bottom left, it can then ultimately impact multiple other systems. And some of our key systems, like the identity service or cryptography, uh, uh, the encryption one, some of those can literally affect 
half of our systems and most of the user requests. And if we don't account for those transit of failures, it's very easy for the entire system to be taken down. And so we need to bulkhead at all these different uh, points. Everywhere there's a system relationship, we need to take control of that so that we can degrade gracefully and isolate the failure to where it occurred rather than allowing it to cause multiple other systems to fail and then now having uh, to make the user try and degrade all of those systems together. So each of these relations in the system is a point where we have to take control of the, the failure modes and isolate them and control them if we want to be resilient. I'm going to talk about application state now. It's definitely something that needs to be reasoned about if we're going to be resilient. And so one of the models is that we can keep all the state in the particular application. I mentioned this earlier with uh, the sticky sessions. And one approach is that we can cluster, we do a cluster replication and other similar approaches. And then as you scale up, then you've got shards of replicated state. And I've seen this work, and there's some very sophisticated software out there, and sometimes this is the, the solution. But it does mean that all instances are now stateful in your entire system. And this can be done, but it doesn't always have to be. And I'd like to present some other options where if uh, you can, it's preferable sometimes to put the state elsewhere so we can simplify and bound the context of what it means to actually be resilient in uh, the face of failure. So one of the simplest ones is to put that state down in the client. Let each client worry about the state of where they are in the flow of the application. And so for Netflix, we've got 50 million users. If they're all signing in, let each of them worry about the state of where they are in the workflow. Let them worry about making sure that, yeah, I've got my credentials. I can now hit any server I want. It doesn't matter. I don't need to be pinned to any of them. And that simplifies the live server side because now we can route you to whichever box makes sense. And failure modes and scaling is far simpler. Sometimes, though, the amount of state is just too large to be sending down to the client, especially if it's a small uh, latency-bound client like a, a mobile device. You've got network uh, connections and bandwidth and latency that can make it so that you actually can't or don't want to send all of the data down. But we don't want to, just for that reason, necessarily make all of our systems now stateful. And so one of the solutions we've done is we make heavy use of ephemeral caches like memcached. We're starting to use Redis. And for certain use cases, we will put transitive state off in these caches that are low single digit millisecond uh, request times to fetch from any system in our, from any instance in our system. And so when a user request comes in, in one or two milliseconds, I've got that state back ephemerally just for the scope of that request and I can reason about it and do it. And I've, but the application instances themselves don't need to maintain that state. We use this for things such as pagination actually. So if on the grid of movies, the list of list of movies, we would like to, as much as possible, keep it consistent so as you're scrolling around that you don't get duplicates or weird uh, behavior just because we got two different versions of the, of the list at different times and so we have like the same movie in two rows right above each other. So for that, we say the snapshot at a point in time when we started the UI, we're gonna take that snapshot of the video IDs in the lists, put it in an ephemeral cache, and now the user retains one piece of state, a token that references this key in a cache. Each time they come back and say, give me more movies in you know, row 22 and scroll over tw uh, you know, 15 movies over, they can then come into that cache and get a consistent view of the world, but it's all done in a very fault tolerant, resilient way. And if that cache blows up, we've got a, a, a reasonable way of then going back and refreshing it. And so we've been able to figure out where to put the cache in a way that it doesn't complicate everything else. The last of the three places where state really belongs, just throw it in the database, whatever data store that is. Most state ends up there anyway, so let's just put it there to begin with. And most of our system, nowadays, we've got data stores that can perform well enough to do this at scale. And examples of this are complicated workflows of like where you're doing your taxes or whatever. Don't try and store it all in memory and do everything to protect that. Just each step along the way, you throw it in the database, and all the user has to worry about is which page am, am I on, whatever my last progression, and let the data store do what it does well. So why? Isn't this more complicated to have these three possible ways of doing this now, whereas before I could just say, I've got my session state all in my box. Maybe if I was a small, single team, 
building a monolith, but as you build into dozens or hundreds of engineers and have these larger systems, for the same reason we break them up into microservice architectures, the same, for the same reason, putting state in places where you can think about it and reason about it is beneficial. You bound the context around where the state lives so that the, the failure modes on it can be reasoned about independently because they are different and harder than stateless systems. And so, despite having more parts, the same way that microservices does bring in a whole different level of difficulty, on a whole, for the system, it allows you to isolate and decouple things and then assign the right skills and expertise and operational uh, characteristics to those systems. And so, at Netflix, we've got the cloud database engineering team who worries very differently about how their systems scale up and down and fail and break, whereas all the other systems can just completely ignore that problem, and their systems are stateless, and instances can come and go however they choose. And so we're able to have a few focus on the durability of state and the increased problems there, while the rest don't have to worry about that. And a, a simple example, the identity service, if it fails, we've embedded most of the critical state into the cookie that they send back in, so if that identity service fails, we're able to stub out the rest of it and continue. Why? Because if we didn't do that, if we ever lost that service, nothing at Netflix would work because we wouldn't know who you are. And so this is a place where very simple, a very simple solution to the problem was putting the state in the right place so that then everything else can just be informed and have a, a, a good degraded uh, use, uh, state if we're unable to talk to the identity service. Moving on to the next big part of complex systems is that decision makers are locally rather than globally rational. So this is uh, derived from the, far, uh, the part that no one in the system actually can have a full view of the system. It's the definition of a complex system. That doesn't mean, though, that their decisions cannot lead to global or system-wide events. In fact, that is one of the properties of complex systems. Local actions can have global results. So I'm gonna I want to go through how this actually happens, because this is how uh, complex systems work, and no one no one person actually has a view of all of the things that are being decided and how it's going to impact you. Load shedding. You make a decision to shed load to protect your system. The outcome that may happen very often without being considered is that you will cause retry storms that come back and pound you and DDoS you. This has happened to so many systems that we actually at Netflix now have started to do things like put uh, delays before we actually shed load so that we will actually tell the users to like, I'm just going to park you over here because even though we try and get all of our devices to do like proper exponential retries and back offs and all that stuff, there's always one device somewhere that is doing it wrong and has a bug and just sits there in a tight loop, tight loop and DDoSes us. And so very interesting that even something as simple as load shedding, which you would think is actually protecting your system, can have side effects because you're, locally, you're making a local decision to shed load, the client is making a local decision to say, I need to get this data as fast as I can, and the two fight and end up with these retry storms, and you end up with two, three, four times the amount of traffic coming in in waves. Another one is the cache shard failure. You put it in for performance reasons and for capacity management, and all of a sudden you DDoS your origin and wipe out the entire system. Dynamic property changes. This is the easiest way to kill a system. You've got all of your applications running, a P, running the same code, and they've got uh, a conditional, some conditional logic in there waiting for a bit to flip somewhere. Someone goes to a, a system, pushes a button, says, yep, flip that bit from Boolean, the Boolean from true, false to true. All of a sudden, you've just enabled a new code path in your system that was not fully exercised, and may, you now saturate all CPUs on some processing that should never have been in production, and you wipe out your entire fleet. We have done this at Netflix. Reactive scalings, you're scaling your instances up and down. And so let's say that as you're scaling up, you then have a blip. Let's say that you have a network outage that for a couple minutes wipes out all network traffic. So your traffic just plummets. Well, your, your auto-scaling algorithm goes, I am no longer under load, so I'm going to start shutting down servers. It starts shutting them down on you. And then two minutes later, this wave of traffic, not only is it the normal traffic that you would have there, it's now typically higher because all of your instances are doing the whole retry storm thing. And so you get this wave that comes back and you're, now you're scaled down. And now your system tries to scale back up but it's too late. 
or you're just because the Super Bowl's happening. So, very interesting pattern, Super Bowl, Netflix is going along, so the game starts, viewing drops, halftime, people actually flip over to watch uh, Netflix again, and then it drops back down, and the game, and then comes back up. Used to be that we actually had to like turn off auto scaling when the Super Bowl is going to happen, so we wouldn't scale down. Thankfully, we've got better systems than that now. This is the, the, the most pernicious one, is that you, you do all this effort and you achieve resilience, and you're like, great, we got it, it's working, we understand how the system fails, and then you start to neglect it because you're like, well, we don't really need to test it anymore, it's fine. Or, you know, the cost of testing this is kind of high, it takes people's time, it's boring, or we, we risk impacting users by doing failure testing in our production environment, so let's, we can chill now, we're good. And then weeks go by and months go by and all this time you're like deploying new code and launching new systems and scaling differently and you drift. And this is the whole premise of that book, Drift into Failure. And then you're vulnerable. Despite everything that Netflix does right, we still do this sometimes because it's so easy as a human to just not pay attention to these details and to allow it to drift. That's how um, the shuttles have exploded. That's how planes crash. That's how doctors accidentally kill patients it's not because they go out to do this, it's because we're making these local decisions that all seem right at the time, and then we drift far from the point until we pass over some threshold, and then disaster happens. James Hamilton, who has been at Microsoft and Amazon, builds all the data centers for AWS, says failure recovery must be a very simple path, and that path must be tested frequently. We've got the Simeon Army, cool name and logos for very simple tooling that allows us to do things like automatically run around and kill instances. It's making sure that we actually are capable of being resilient to that. This one is so easy for everyone except for the, the database teams that the stateless systems, is just, it's just a, a no-op. We don't even think about it at Netflix. The database systems, and this is why the bounding of context was important for us, they had to think a lot harder about this problem. And actually, it took them a lot longer before they could actually let this run and they could survive it. So you could kill Cassandra nodes and we could let this thing loose on a, on a Cassandra ring and just let things die. But it's important that you're actually able to do that so that when something real happens that you're okay. Like a few weeks ago when all of a sudden every single server at Amazon had to be rebooted for a patch, we were good. It didn't matter. It just took care of itself because we were used to things failing and being replaced. This guy kills his own, that guy kills regions. We do these things so that we can actually prove that we can handle these types of failures. And, know how they behave. Auditing is important so that you understand how things fail and also find where you're, you've got weaknesses. This is one where we were doing a latency injection test and we caused the, the big red circle there to fail like we expected. The thing on the right though was not what we expected to have happen. We broke Apple TV completely when we did this test. Within about 30 seconds, we found it, we stopped it, the users were, were okay, so we impacted users for about 30 seconds. We went back and the net, we fixed it. The next week we redid the test and the, there was no longer user impact for this. So we, were, we took the risk and did impact users for a short blip, but this, I know from experience that this saves us the multi-hour outages when it happens when it's out of our control and then we have nothing to do but wait for the system to uh, be fixed. Here's another one where we injected latency, and we can see the latency go from 125 um, at the 99.5th percentile up to 1500. We see the fallbacks kick in as we're rejecting and timing out, but we can see that the number of exceptions that we're throwing to our users stays about the same, and so we can see that we're, we're handling the, the behavior on the system, and we've got fallbacks and we're, we're isolating the failure. I'm gonna show you one of our, our newest examples as we're maturing these tools. A particular user, uh, this is a colleague on my team, he uh, implements something that's currently called FIT, uh, Failure Injection Testing. It really needs a, a monkey name. And this is what his home screen looks like. He goes and flips a switch that allows us to inject failure in a very controlled manner into his use, uh, use case. And so everything before is successful. We flip it into failure mode, and this one's actually pretty severe failure mode. He turns off all systems except for like the six or seven that are fairly critical. He but he turns off all the personalization, all of the, like, the, the bookmarks, and all those different types of things. And so we've got these failure modes now, 
and we can see that everything has moved into a success mode. And so this is the, the request logs where we can see all the dependencies it hit and what happened with them, how many times they were called, what their latency was, uh, failure, and then fallback status. This is what his, his device now looks like when he, lo when he launches in fallback mode. He doesn't have any of his personalization. You can see it doesn't actually have his list of movies. It's giving him Saving Santa instead of the one it was giving him. And so if we didn't have fallback, this would be a completely broken experience. Now, it's highly likely that some users will see this and go, this is not my Netflix. I'm going off to do something else. And we will see a drop in, in usage. But this is a far better state to be in where people can still see popular content, find what they're looking for, rather than completely blow up. And this is considered one of our worst case type of uh, degraded modes. The other aspect of a complex system is it's constantly changing. Within a, within a given cluster, the, the code is constantly being uh, updated and changed. And, the, and not only that code, but all the trends of dependencies that we interact with, is just constantly uh, uh, changing. Dozens and dozens of deployments a day are going on at Netflix. And so there is no constant state where you can reason about the system. To help us deal with that, we take production traffic coming in and route it to different clusters where we can do different things with them. One of them is we use a canary uh, process where when we're going to deploy new code, we launch an instance of, of the new code with another instance of the old code. We run them for a period of time and we compare the metrics. And so our build pipeline will allow us to actually measure the quality of that. This one didn't do so well, it got a 77%. Here's another one where as it went through our build pipeline, it got a score of 96% and then later went on to be deployed in each of our regions. That Canary score is taking 1,000 plus metrics between the two systems as they go through the, their life cycle together. We launch them at the same time so that they, they're at the same life cycle as far as warming up, um, garbage collections, memory leaks, whatever it might be. So we can actually compare them at this, in the same life cycle. This one did well. We track the metrics that are cold, metrics that are hot. And then this one didn't do so well. And so this is one of the tools that we use to be able to manage change in our environment. Another one is that as we're going to push new code, we squeeze test it. It is very easy to get any one line of code in a system that all of a sudden changes what throughput and latency characteristics you have in your code. And so when we run, uh, when we have a new block of code, a new um, deployment we want to deploy, we put it in this cluster and we increment it by five RPS at a time until we break it. And we can then compare the differences between the two and we can make a few decisions. Either the performance is degraded too badly for us to continue or, or we're going to be okay with it and, and we can fix it later or it's perfectly good, the performance is the same or better. And, and then any of those, the, the values there are then fed into our auto scaling algorithms so that we know then how many instances we need to serve the traffic at the different times of day that we know we need to serve. Another variant of a, of a canary that we have is a long lived canary. This one is the same code is running in production. It runs for the entire lifespan of that particular version of code. And we have uh, bytecode instrumented the application here to uh, intercept all network traffic. And what we're looking for is unisolated or uh, paths that are not bulkheaded. This happens because of that whole dynamic property change where there's latent code sitting somewhere in your system that's not actually active when we canary it. And someone flips a switch one day, a few days in, or in our case, typically a few hours because our code only lives a day or two at a time. Um, you flip a switch, all of a sudden a new code path has been, uh, is being executed and it's doing network calls that are not isolated and it's now a vulnerability to us. We fire alerts and trigger um, the production support and we're able to then go analyze whether we need to get that turned off. We can roll forward and fix it. And so this is another mechanism where we need to be constantly auditing our systems. Failure though, always, it, 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 it inevitably will happen. And this is what it should look like when it is isolated. All these other instances around it, uh, this is one of our real-time monitoring systems, this screenshot. This particular social get title context is failing. And we can, we can see that it's isolated without impacting anyone else. We can also see that it's not a complete outage. The boxes are locally making decisions. So 76 of them have their circuits in an open state, 158 in a closed. And you can see that even though each, local, each instance is making local decisions that end up being binary, at a cluster level, it becomes very adaptive. And you can see it just kind of ebbing and flowing across the system. 
Here's another one where it was a low error rate of 20%. We can see the error rate increase, but then the fallback's kicking in to address those, and the fallbacks are hitting for only the 20% that were failing. We found that we needed to monitor our systems in a fairly low latency manner. This is, a, this is about a one to two second, uh, behind, this is behind production by about one to two seconds, gathering the metrics of all of our servers so that we have insight into what's going on and it's showing us the last 10 seconds of behavior. In our environment, 10 seconds is an eternity. Systems have died or come back to life in that time as you've processed um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of requests. And so it, with this, we're able to make changes to the system and watch it and interact with it in time where you're actually able to reason about it, rather than five minutes behind, where if you have data at the once per minute aggregate step, it takes you a couple minutes before you have three, four, five data points. You make a decision, you flip a switch, it propagates out, you wait another five minutes before you can see five data points. This instead is giving you a data point every second, and when we push a button to like propagate a property change, it starts to roll out across the fleet in seconds. We can watch it take impact. This is, not, this is neat to look at when the system is healthy. We have found it's critical when you're doing deployments and when you're dealing with production issues. Because that's when you're actually locally reason, when you're reasoning about the system and you need a, a feedback loop that allows you to make decisions and reason about it. This is where we're headed with newer systems, so we can start to, as we continue to grow, uh, we need to let the tools enable, co uh, provide context and evidence to the humans, so we have a hope of actually operating these systems. So complex systems run as broken systems. The system continues to function because it contains so many redundancies and because people can make it function despite the presence of many flaws. I have seen many a code base and many a system that I seriously believe are only operating because of the sheer willpower of the engineers. It is, uh, there are some multi-billion dollar code bases that are running these huge businesses. And as you step through the code, it is sheer willpower. that They're able to deploy it and get it out there and make it work. We really should not be relying upon her heroics to make our systems work. Instead, we should be allowing them, to, we should, uh, adapt to the fact that they run as broken systems, that they need to have resilience engineered into them, that these need to be patterns that we can think about and decouple and, and isolate the individual components so, so we can con consider them in isolation, and then be able to try and give us a hope of actually reasoning about how they interact with each other across these relationship boundaries when they are uh, interacting with each other. So where to next? Where's the thinking in this space? Low latency anomaly detection is an area where uh, we can all start to look at this a lot more. The technologies are in place. Now this isn't just for like, is my server broken? That's a solved problem. Where we're interested about this is 50 million users, there's 10,000 of them over here that are having a problem on some random device combined with this one random set of titles. How can, today that's noise. How can we make it so that our systems can apply machine learning and uh, statistical analysis of this stuff in real time. So if I put out a new encoding of a video and the metadata is slightly wrong and there's a cache in one part of Ireland that is broken, that we can then identify that and fix it rather than waiting for it to become bad enough that we get noise through customers or even worse, we never even hear about it and the customers just get fed up and give up. So can we get our systems doing this on our behalf. I know we can, we just need to spend the time on it. Automating configuration. Configuring things like bulkheading and timeouts and uh, resource allocations and all that stuff. It's doable as a human when you're measuring them in tens of things. Once they become hundreds and the relationships explode, humans are horrible at this stuff. We get it all wrong. This has become the biggest source of outage at Netflix. Humans and configuration mixing poorly. We need to get to a point where this can become fully automated and apply con uh, like control system theories and those types of things at scale in, in ways where the humans should not be involved in setting things like timeouts. Global versus regional deployments, they're different, but we need to stop thinking about regional deployments differently. We just need to deploy globally and let the systems do this. As we grow, what happens is that the, the, the mental model of humans, we're, just, it, we're not good at saying, I've got 20 data centers to go into, or even three. It's very common to say, here's my home base, it's all good. Oh yeah, there's that other continent I have to go worry about, it's totally broken. 
We need to let our systems get into places where we conceptually have an application that we say go deploy, and it worries about things like, what is the, the, the amount of traffic per data center that I need? How, what's the latency characteristics across these different relationships? What is the time zone of peak traffic here? So I will do my deployment off peak there, but that might be my peak time here. All those types of decisions. We've already moved away from treating servers as pets. We no longer give them names and, and have feelings for them. We've put them in clusters. As systems grow, we need to stop treating clusters as pets. We now have names and feelings and emotions about clusters. We need to move on to just treating them as herds of clusters of, and let the systems take care of this for us. Because it goes back to the same thing as the regional versus global. We need to abstract away a lot of that stuff so that the machines do what they're good at, which is repetitively doing the same thing over and over and over again and thinking hard about the precise math of the latency characteristics here and sizing over here. Humans are bad at, this st at that stuff. Typically what we'll do is we'll spend a whole lot of time getting it right once and then we just let it sit for months and then it's wrong a day later. And then it's just sitting there as a latent bug waiting to happen and it will kill us later. Human involvement in these complex systems is the biggest source of trouble, honestly. And we have to find ways to improve that relationship between machine and human if we want to operate these systems at scale in a resilient manner. We need to, by definition, when the system comes crying for help, when it pages you, it is because the human could not figure out what to do at that point in time. They didn't reason about that particular state. It's an emergent problem that the humans have not figured out. So when we wake them up at two in the morning and say, come fix this, how are they going to have any hope of figuring that out through their um, sleepy brain and when everything is broken around them? We need to be able to get to a point where the system can degrade in a better way, like the nuclear reactor example, and then provide them the context as to this is what's going on, here's the evidence of what's going on, now you can start to help make us some decisions. The other aspect of this, we have to automate as much as possible if we ever want to achieve three and four nines. A machine can respond in milliseconds or seconds depending upon the algorithms that you, you need to apply. Even if it's single digit minutes, if you want to have enough state built up as you're doing anomaly detection to make a decision about changing something. Humans, by the time they're paged in, they get up, figure out where they are, sign into VPN, get on a call, bootstrap themselves into the problem. You're measuring tens of minutes at best. Typically, it's 30 to 60 minutes before anything in a complex, in a complex uh, outage has any hope of being resolved with humans involved. We'll ask, can we actually get to a point where you can automatically assert production readiness of systems? When we're deploying code so fast, we've gotten pretty good at asserting the functional behavior but it's much harder to assert, is everything configured and tuned right that we will actually be resilient and fail well? This is a hard problem. Netflix is getting to a point now where we have automated systems of uh, our, our various different user interfaces that then can do automated uh, executions through our fault injection system so that they will execute themselves in repetitive uh, tests against different failure modes. And we're asserting that the, that the user interface behaves correctly against all those different failure modes. This is something that's like brand new in the last couple months we're putting out. And already it's getting to the point now where we can start to identify regressions when a user interface or a server change has come along that breaks one of these resilience uh, aspects. Our goal is to get that to a point where it is constantly nonstop running all day, every day on all of our major uh, UIs. And when one of those fails, it is treated as a production alert because it is a, a latent availability problem just waiting to happen if one of those occurs. In closing, James Hamilton, he states this, we have long believed that 80% of operations issues originate in design and development. When systems fail, when, sorry, ah, when, when systems fail, there's a natural tendency to look first to operations since that is where the problem actually took place. It's all the ops guy's fault. It's part of the why the DevOps thing is actually uh, very useful because there is none of this blame game. The guy who wrote the code, the guy or gal who wrote the code is the one who's operating the code, who's fixing the code. You blame yourself. You start to feel your own pain. Most operations issues, however, either have their genesis in design and development or are best solved there. I very much agree with this. You cannot solve resilience in operations issues just by bolting on things after the fact. 
You cannot solve it by putting in place uh, extra hardware um, solutions. A hardware load balancer most definitely will not solve this. I, that has been argued against me multiple times. It just, you put in this device and it takes care of your problems for you. Uh, we need to design it into our systems. Resilience is by design. It's something that each and every one of us, we need to take into consideration. We should abstract away as much of this as possible into uh, our applications so that not every engineer needs to be worrying about every aspect of the system in the same way that not every engineer is necessarily going to want to worry about a mutex lock. But that does not mean that we can just abdicate responsibility of this to someone else or to some other system or to some other library or framework. We need to reason about this in our application design if we want to achieve three and four nines of availability, 24-7 uh, service globally. Other some resources to look at, these two books that I link to, Drift Into Failure and Release It, are uh, highly recommended. Drift Into Failure does not actually talk about software systems. But I find it very valuable to go look into decades of research in environments where complex systems theory has been studied in depth because it affects lives. Thankfully, in my business, we don't affect lives. And so we're able to be, able, you know, we call it running with scissors. We can run with scissors more often than not. But every time we fail, it's costing us user experience, it's costing us our brand. Uh, our brand. It sh if we end up on TechCrunch headlines, that doesn't help us at all. And so the same principles as to how to operate these systems apply to all of us, just the level of, of priority is where it might uh, alter. Thank you, and if we've got time, I can take questions or you can grab me afterwards.